Welcome to the virtual lunch. Today is Friday, June 11th, and this is virtual lunch number 324. Our guest today is Ashley Walter, who's a partner with Oric in Seattle. He leads the firm's environmental, social, and governance initiatives. And this is part of our continuing series on empowering engagement with Joinder. Ashley, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining the virtual lunch. Thanks for having me. Happy to chat with folks today. So Ashley, let's start. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background and your practice at Oric? So I actually studied a master's program, a joint program in law school. I found a way many years ago at this point to essentially study socially responsible investment, economic and environmental ethics. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And I had a lot of classmates asking me, why are you doing this? Why are you spending time on this? Why are you getting this separate degree? And I didn't have an answer. I just found it really interesting and fascinating and, and studied some of the related issues as an undergrad. And when I got out of law school right away, laws and regulations that address ESG in the U.S. started to, to appear. One of the first laws was the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which is a California law that essentially requires companies to make a website disclosure, certain companies, regarding kind of what they're doing to combat human trafficking. When I was at my first firm out of law school, I put myself on the client alert team where young lawyers could jump in and write client memos about new laws. So really, as like a pretty young associate, I was working directly with public companies to do this work. And then really after that, it didn't take very long to market this. I am now at Oric. Oric is a wonderful place to do this work. For a number of reasons. One, it has the same vision I have for this area, which is that this is a fundamental business strategy issue for companies. And companies really need very sophisticated, robust, tailored advice from lawyers in this area for all sorts of reasons. Then in addition to sharing the vision that I have for it, it's also just a law firm that has all kind of the requisite parts. ESG is a very strange beast in terms of the legal practice, and it has some interesting constituent parts. Oric has the really the important parts, and I could discuss them in turn, but one of the really important ones it has is that Oric is just really hyper-focused on energy transition. So it's an incredible law firm when it comes to advising clients in the area of, of energy and environmental issues, and it's just really well positioned to do that. And that's a huge part of the way that clients are tackling these issues is addressing the E and ESG. And so to have a law firm that can do that is really important. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be where I am working on just really wonderful, exciting things, amazing things that companies are doing in this space, taking it very seriously. It's a roller coaster ride. I mean that in a hundred percent good way. And I'm really happy to be where I am. The real change that happened in the last four or five years is that ESG became a board level issue. They became governance issues. In the US, public companies are not required, at least not in a very clear and meaningful way to disclose ESG information and data. So this is how we've thought about Joinder is essentially as a feature that allows companies to organize ESG work streams and work on documents over time and sign responsibility and deadlines and share versions and things like that. It's a powerful tool for that exercise. But this is the way that technology can really help companies do this, is organize ESG. Data and metrics are really important. This is really an area where things are proliferating in the sense that there's more and more standards that include quantitative features for ESG. So the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is one of the main standards that has the pole position, both, for example, BlackRock and the SEC, it's full of quantitative measures. It has 77 different industries, and that's a really important piece of it. There's other frameworks and standards that do that. If there's one thing that is the cause of a company reaching out to me more than any other thing, it is the board getting a laggard score from one of these organizations and being very concerned about it. And it's a black box. It's a number or a letter grade, and it's extremely hard to figure out how they got there. It's extremely hard to figure out how to pull the levers to fix it. And it's a data metrics problem. It's an information problem. Companies that have the ability to get their minds and hands around metrics, particularly in the area of ESG, are going to have an advantage in designing an effective program and being able to effectively communicate their ESG performance, their ESG strategy to the constituencies that are extremely important today for public companies. And one of the most important of those constituencies is investors. And that's what these examples had to do with. Folks have probably heard the term greenwashing, where companies put up disclosures, say they're doing XYZ, but it's really just kind of a check the box exercise. It's a real big issue. It's very dangerous for companies to treat this as a check the box exercise. From a legal perspective, what we often talk about is the liability that can be associated with that. And there actually is quite a bit. 
because if companies put up policies where they don't really know what they're saying, if they put up disclosures where maybe they didn't think about it very much and they say they're doing something or they use some fuzzy language, but it actually can't be traced back to any particular activity they're doing, there's a lot of potential liability there, frankly, whether they're public or not. We actually are now advising companies that are publishing sustainability reports. We're actually advising that they subject those disclosures to the same rigorous disclosure controls and procedures that they subject SEC filings to because the SEC is actually looking at these disclosures outside of the SEC and considering them. And as these issues become more significant to the SEC and others, we think there's going to be just more and more scrutiny on these disclosures. Even if companies are only doing complying with regulation because they have to, it does focus on the issue even more. And if there are laggards, it requires them to take a look at it. These activities really do produce long-term value. COVID actually is one of the developments, very tragically, that showed that because the firms that were able to pivot or better address issues in terms of supply chain security, remote work policies, sick leave policies, pivoting to an online business, the ones that were more resilient actually weathered the massive market turndown and all of the developments that occurred around that time emerged in a better position than many other firms that weren't resilient in that way. So tragically, it was actually a massive development that showed the true value that could be created by having a resilient and a sustainable business. And I think there's going to be positive examples going forward, how these measures can actually produce long-term value. There's all these different standards out there. There's all these different frameworks that have all these different criteria and KPIs. It's actually not necessarily the quality of the data. It's just that there's too much data. So what one report does, for example, is actually it has within it all of these different criteria and all these different kinds of frameworks. And it basically can take pieces of data that you can obtain from various parts of your organizations. You can farm out these requests and then you can pull it back in and apply it against all these different indices and frameworks. So whereas Joinder is a tool that's just very flexible and can be used from there. So at least in the U.S., in terms of legal requirements for disclosure, there's actually individual statutes or regs that require certain things, but there's really nothing right now in terms of mandatory for ESG disclosure, and we just expect that to happen fairly soon with federally with the SEC. This goes back to what I was discussing when I was doing this really early on in my career, because what I was going around saying, among other things, was essentially that you don't find ESG lawyers in nature. They're kind of Frankenstein lawyers. To be kind of a pure ESG lawyer, you deal with a lot of varying items that are not in the same practice areas. So you deal with things like, again, commercial law, if you're helping to negotiate manufacturing agreements and supplier agreements that have provisions that require certain items. There's governance-related issues. You might put in corporate compliance or white-collar crime areas, things like creating policies and compliance processes and procedures, et cetera. Modern slavery and anti-trafficking are huge areas in this realm. Obviously, there's environmental issues. The list goes on. So a lawyer that can actually holistically and essentially just talk to a company about these issues and see the whole playing field and be able to handle them, it's just a rare thing because you almost had to raise a lawyer like this doing all these things over time, and it's not easy to do. So for us, it's a big focus is how should the lawyer be involved? We believe that the most effective way to do that is to quarterback the process. And so by that, essentially, again, not being involved in everything, but understanding when the lawyer should be involved. And frankly, having a seat at the table to just be at the client's side generally throughout the process. So that's kind of how we can see it in terms of how we can help. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of the top topics within ESG, and it's going to get more disclosure coverage from public companies mm -hmm. going forward. There's going to be, in my opinion, lots of continued problems going forward about companies checking boxes, complying with some regulation, whether from the SEC or otherwise, without actually taking it very seriously, without a real cultural change without a tone from the top. In my opinion, if we said anything different, it just, just wouldn't be true. That being said, whether it's DEI or any other ESG issue, I do think that the continued requirements of companies to think very critically about these issues, because they're going to be putting their positions on these issues in front of the public through public filings, I think that will continue to drive progress over time. Way more attention is being paid to this than before. I think it will continue to go in that direction. And I don't see that abating anytime soon. It's a small step, but I think more of that will be happening. In my, my Ashley Walter, everybody. <laughs> what a fantastic guest. I want to thank you, Ashley. I want to thank the team at Joinder for just supporting our conversations on empowering engagement. It's really been a privilege. Thank you so very much.